We are looking this hour at a question that Jesus asked. Our text is Luke, the 22nd chapter, so we'll be looking at three verses among others this morning in our study. Who is greater is the question the Lord is about to ask. Before we actually look at our text, we want to take a moment to sort of get a feel for the context. I know we're jumping right in the middle of a passage of Scripture here. Luke chapter 22, Jesus is about to die. This is the last week of His life on earth before His crucifixion. His death looms only hours away as of Luke chapter 22. But first, some preliminaries. There is, of course, the Passover meal. It has to be prepared. Jesus gave instruction to the disciples as to taking care of that. Now the preparation has been made. Jesus and His men sit down to eat the Passover meal. He then shocks the disciples by predicting that one of them would betray Him. And, of course, they sort of go around the room wondering, is it me? Is it me? Which one of us will be the traitor? But they don't wonder very long because the next thing you know, they start arguing. Not arguing about which one will betray Jesus, but which one of them was the greatest. Luke twenty-two twenty-four. 24, there was also a strife or contention among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest? Which of us is the greatest? But keep in mind, the Lord is about to die, and He has told them that. This just doesn't sink in to the gray matter, and so instead of feeling for Jesus, who is about to die, all they can think about is themselves. And their counterpart is Legion today, who have this worldly mindset, it's all about me. It's just all about me. I'm afraid a lot of the hatred and spite and division that we face in our world today can be traced, at least in part, back to this disposition. It's all about me. Not the needs of others, not the feelings of others, not the hurts of others. It's all about me. The disciples, you would think, would be thinking about their Lord who's about to die, but no, it's all about me. Which of us is going to be the greatest? And don't you know that all of them wanted to be that one? They wanted to be number one. Well, Jesus has heard enough. He takes opportunity to tell them that true greatness in the kingdom of God belongs to those who serve. Those who serve. Jesus will ask the question, who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? We'll note that question a bit later in our study. But Jesus teaches that in the Christian life, it is always better to serve than to be served. By no stretch of the imagination, if I'm a servant of God, is it all about me? It's not all about me. And I need to erase that mindset from my thinking, if I, if I have that, I'm guilty of that. We want to note this morning three truths that help us see greatness in the eyes of God and asking the question, who is greater? First of all, Jesus will begin by looking at the world. He looks at the world or the, the cultural perspective. It was true then, and of course it is true today. A lot of the teachings of Jesus ran completely counter to worldly thinking. Jesus, for instance, taught in the Sermon on the Mount that you should love your enemies, that you should bless those who curse you, and that you should rejoice whenever persecution. The world has no place in its thinking for any of that. Those concepts are in direct opposition to a world that says, Enemies are not to be loved. Enemies are to be attacked. Curses are to be matched. And persecution, you want to avoid that at all, at all cost. Well, Jesus makes an observation about the culture of this world. You say, first of all, consider how the world. Let's look at this from the cultural or worldly perspective. Who's greater? We know how the world will answer that question. How the world views power. Notice verse 25. He said to them, hearing their arguing, who's greatest among us, he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. Again, Jesus speaks of the rulers of the day. He 
could have Roman rulers in mind. They obviously would be Gentiles. And they exercise lordship over their subjects. That exercise lordship comes from one word in the original. It means to lord over somebody. Jesus points to these Gentile kings of the day, and he says that kings use power to control their subjects. They lord it over the lives of their subjects. And so according to the world, power is opportunity to control others. If a person can get power, whether in government or a company or a business the world says that power is the perfect vehicle to control people and tell people what to do. And just look through history. In fact, you don't have to look far back in history, world history, to see examples of kings exercising lordship over their subjects. Hitler probably would come to mind at the top of the list, followed close second by Mussolini, Lenin, Stalin, Chairman Mao, Saddam Hussein. Just a few examples of men who used power to control others. But again, Jesus is pointing out a philosophy that pervades human culture. If you have power, you can use that power to tell people what you want them to do. That's how the world views power. And the world says, I want that power because I want to control others. Second, how the world views position. Again, back to verse 25. They that exercise authority upon them, that is their subjects, are called benefactors. Now, that's not a household word around the Cox house, benefactor. The word benefactor comes from a compound of two words in the original. It literally means good workers. Good workers. Jesus is saying that in this world system, those that hold positions of authority are admired, envied, looked up to, and regarded as somebody who's done something right. Now, the Bible does say as Christians we ought to respect those in positions of authority. That's not what we're talking about. And that's not the worldly perspective we're talking about here. We live in a world that equates position with achievement. If somebody has climbed the ladder moved up at the top, those people are celebrated, patted on the back. Even though they, have, they may have achieved their rise to success by doing unethical and unscrupulous things, it doesn't matter because they're at the top. Again, they get the accolades. Can you imagine working for a company among whose employees 29 have been accused of spousal abuse. Seven have been arrested for fraud. 19 have been accused of writing bad checks. 117 have been involved in bankruptcies. Three have served time for assault. 71 have bad credit. 14 have been arrested on drug-related charges. Eight have been arrested for shoplifting. 21 are being sued, and 84 were arrested for drunk driving in one year. Can you imagine working in a company like that with those kind of employees? Well, what company is that? Well, it's our United States Congress. That's whose company we're talking about here. And while we would view a lot of folks guilty of those things as scoundrels, because these individuals are politicians and are at the top while people gush and fawn over them for no other reason than they hold position. Well, you and I could never get away with any of that and we would be frowned upon and we would be called scandals but whenever you reach status in the minds of some at least it really doesn't matter what you do or how you got there you got there is all that matters. That is the cultural perspective. It was true then. That's what the disciples are arguing about. We want to be number one. We want to be the greatest. And that's the mindset of the majority of the world in which we live today. Jesus says, erase that from your mind.
Let's look at the godly position of what greatness is. Jesus will say, but you shall not be so. We'll see that in a moment in verse 26. But again, contrasting verse 25, the cultural or worldly perspective with what Jesus wants of his followers. The world wants and worships position and power, but that is not the person of God. Notice, first of all, how the Christian should understand achievement. Verse 26, But you shall not be so. You want greatness in my eyes, forget about the cultural perspective. You shall not be so, but he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. Jesus says that for the child of God, true greatness does not come from climbing, but from condescending. Not from going up as the world says, but actually by going down. Note the phrase, if you want to be great, be as the younger. And that may not mean a lot to us in our time and culture, but when you look at this from the standpoint of those who lived in the first century, they, they could understand the illustration that Jesus is using. In that time, you always gave the youngest son the most unpleasant tasks around the house to perform. We might equate it to washing dishes or taking out the trash. The eldest son, you wouldn't dream of asking him to do that. It's beneath his dignity now that he's reached that position of status in the family. You don't want to have your hands dirty, in other words, by doing the servant's chores. Jesus says, well, you need to rethink. If you want to be great in my sight, then you're willing to do those things that nobody else wants to do. You're willing to serve. I know I've used this illustration before, but it just fits so well. And I, I want to use it again. In the early 1920s in the Nashville area, several congregations of the Churches of Christ decided, let's have an area-wide meeting. One big meeting in Ryman Auditorium, and it'll seat thousands, and we'll, we'll get someone to do the preaching. And that, of course, was the question, who will we ask to preach? And will those who are not asked to preach be offended? Well, N.B. Hardeman, of course, was asked to preach in that series of, of meetings. C.M. Pullius was a gospel preacher as well. But again, they didn't ask him to do the preaching. They asked him instead if, if, if he would lead the singing. And Brother Pullius his response was classic and illustrates the point we're making here. He said, I will sweep the floors of this place if it will help in this effort. I'll do anything if it will help this gospel effort. That's what Jesus is talking about here. That is greatness in the eyes of God. That is greatness where it counts. The world doesn't fathom that. But again, we see the contrast between the world and what God wants. Notice not only how the Christian should understand achievement, but secondly, how the Christian uses authority. Authority is not wrong. We live under authority. We must have authority for a functioning society, but it needs to be used in the right way, and certainly when it comes to the kingdom of God. Notice verse 26 again. But you shall not be so. He was greatest among you. Let him be as the younger. And he that is chief, let him be a servant. Let the leader be a servant. Now this word chief speaks of one who leads or rules. This word servant is the word we get the word deacon from in our English language. That word serve literally means to wait tables. It means to wait tables. Jesus says, those who are godly, those who lead and have authority over the body, ought to be waiting tables, ought to be serving and performing acts of service. For the kingdom of God, authority and leadership are opportunities then to serve. Leadership is not an opportunity to give orders, though orders, of course, at times must be given. Leadership is a chance to serve, to serve others. During the Revolutionary War, 
A man in civilian clothes rode up beside a group of men. They were trying to repair a defensive barrier and their leader was just standing there shouting commands at those men. They were struggling to do the job. And the man on the horseback stopped and asked the leader, why aren't you helping your men? And the man shouted back, I'm a corporal. These are my men. They can do the job. Well, the stranger apologized and got off his own horse. And he went over and he helped those men repair that barrier. Got back on his horse, was about to ride off. And he said to the corporal, next time you have a job like this and not enough men to do it, go to your commander in chief and I'll come and I'll help you again. Unbeknownst to the corporal at the time, the stranger was none other than George Washington, the commander in chief who stopped and helped and served. And how embarrassed, of course, that corporal was and rightly so. Achievement in God's eyes is measured by the service that we give, and authority is a used as a means for accomplishing that service. This runs completely counter to the world's way of thinking and doing and acting, but this is what God wants. Who's greatest? Who's greatest? Who's greater? Third, the correct practice. Verse 27. Who is the greater? The one who sits at the table or the one who serves? We know the world's answer. The fellow who's being served is the greater. The bus boy, why, he's low on the total pole. Who's greater, one who sits at the table or one who serves? Is it not one the, who sits at the table? That's how the world would answer. But I, God, the Lord, and among you as the one who serves. Jesus says in the eyes of the world, it appears the one who's being served is the greater of the two, but you need to rethink that thinking. True greatness comes through service, and Jesus didn't just preach that principle, he practiced it as well. Notice his selflessness. If we're not careful, we confuse the word selfishness with selflessness and they sound a lot alike and they're spelled a lot alike but they're miles apart in meaning. Jesus was selfless, not selfish. And he calls upon us to be the same. If anybody had a right to sit down and be served, it was Jesus. After all, we're talking about the God of the universe. We're talking about the one who's the Word, whose Word brought everything into existence whose word sustains everything by his power. And yet you look at Jesus, you look at him putting aside his heavenly garments. You see him leaving the praises of the myriads of angels in heaven. You see him clothing himself in the humble wrappings of a peasant. He left the streets of gold to walk the dusty streets of Galilee. He left his father's side to eat next to the likes of Peter and Thomas and Judas. He descended from that heavenly throne to be lifted up on a horrific cross before a crowd of spiteful spectators and jeering crowds. Men should have served him, but instead they slew him. He could have claimed the world for himself, but he gave himself for the world instead. That is the epitome of selflessness and of greatness where it counts. Second, consider his service. Again, Jesus told the disciples that leaders in God's eyes, greatness in God's eyes, must be the ones who are involved in serving. Luke does not record this in his account of the gospel, but John does. John chapter 13, what does Jesus do? They've eaten supper. Jesus gets up. He laid aside his outer garments. He took a towel, tied it around his waist. He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Washing feet was essential then as people wore sandals and as everywhere you went, the roads were dusty so your feet were filthy. The point is, this task of washing feet was 
regulated to that of a servant. Jesus, the Lord of the universe, the greatest of all, stoops and performs the task of a servant. This is true greatness in the eyes of God. A man once talked to the preacher about one of the principles he preached about, and the man said it comes all down to what I might call basin theology. Basin theology. The preacher said, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean by basin theology? The man said, remember what Pilate did when he had the chance to acquit Jesus? He called for a basin of water and washed his hands of the whole thing. By contrast, Jesus, the night before his death, called for a basin of water to wash the feet of his disciples. Who is greater? The world would have said Pilate was the greater. We know Jesus to be the greater. The Lord came down to be a servant. And so Jesus left this clear example of what it means to be great in his kingdom. Those who serve are always greater than those who sit in the mind of God. And so we end with a question, who is greater? The world would look at this and say, well, the fellow on the left is greater. I mean, he's bigger, he's taller, must mean he's more important. That's the concept of the world. The one at the top is greater, the one with fame is greater. The one with status is greater. The one with the money and position, that's the greater, so says the world. But ask Jesus, who is greater? And you get a completely different answer. Which is greater? Is it the one served or the one who serves? Jesus answered by his own life. True greatness is found in the example of our Lord Jesus. Peter says Jesus left us an example in suffering, 1 Peter 2, 21. He left us an example in, in everything. Again, the world may be content to sit. Christians strive to serve. We want to be glad to be a servant in the kingdom of God. Folks, there is no position on earth any greater than just being a servant of God. Are you a child of God? I can't be a servant of God unless I'm first a child of God. Putting my faith and trust in Jesus as some of the Son of God, could, repenting of my sins, confessing my Lord, being baptized. That makes me a child of God. That makes me a Christian. That also makes me a servant. Great, not in the eyes of the world, but great where it really counts, in the eyes of God. As a child of God, I want to make sure that I remain a servant and on the right path and doing the right things. And when I stumble, and I do, I ask people to pray for me, encourage me, and we'll certainly do that if you need those prayers. But again, keep in mind what the world thinks and how the world views things should not be our mindset. We want to have the mind of Christ. We want to have the mind and attitude of a servant. That's greatness in the eyes of God. If you need to respond this morning, won't you come as together we stand and as we sing.